The following WCIA3 special presentation is brought to you by Edelman and Steak and Shake. This is Weathering the Storm. Hello and welcome to Weathering the Storm. I'm Chief Meteorologist Kevin Lighty along with meteorologist Adam Claibon and meteorologist Jack Gerfin. We come to you from Taylorville, Illinois, the site of where an EF3 tornado ripped through here just four months ago. That tornado was a part of the biggest outbreak to ever occur in Illinois during the month of December. In total, 27 tornadoes that day and night. Specifically here in Taylorville, the EF3 tornado was a half mile wide and it was on the ground for about 13 miles. In Taylorville, 406 houses received some type of damage with 34 of them being completely destroyed. What was amazing about this tornado was the actual lead time that the National Weather Service gave. 41 minutes before the tornado hit, they had issued a tornado warning. We were on the air giving those warnings out that night and even following along and chasing the storm in our vehicle. There were 22 injuries, but amazingly, no one was killed. And that's something to be said about a tornado with 155 mile per hour winds. Many people were picking up pieces for months to come, and unfortunately, some are still picking them up today. There are so many stories of survival from this tornado. That's where we are going to start tonight as we meet Brandon Gatton, a man who survived this devastating EF3 tornado as he tells his story. We just noticed, it, you know, it was oddly warm. For December, it was really warm. I was like, I, I kind of, you know, at first I kind of liked it. This is Brandon Gatton, a lifelong resident of Taylorville and a business owner. This was, um, at one point, uh, a garage. A garage that is no longer standing after the Taylorville tornado. Over, over there, we had you know, the equipment for the, the blasting cabinets, the the vinyl, the vinyl machine, the t-shirt machine. Brandon owned his own print shop that was once in this garage that sat just behind his childhood home. Little did Brandon know, just a few minutes later, the same place he was sitting inside of would no longer be standing. When we heard the first siren, we're like, oh, yeah, here we go again. You know, there's, a, there's another siren. We, 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 we've heard them, you know, hundreds of times before. We, we just ignore them. So we just kind of sat back and relaxed, and that's when my phone started ringing. On the other end of that phone line, my mother. Who was inside the home that sat just 50 feet from the garage Brandon was in. And when she called me and told me that, I was like, yeah, right. Hung up the phone, set it on the desk. I'm like, no, nah, there's nothing like this is ever going to happen here. He's like, I'm staying out here. It's OK. I said, no, come in here and humor me. I says, come in and see what's going on in this TV, because this is nuts. This is crazy. You know, about three, about two or three minutes, phone rings again. And she said it again. She goes, seriously, I need to get, you know, I want you to get in here. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, mom, it's fine. I am in a perfectly good sound structure. <laughs> yeah, you see where I'm going with this? Uh, two or three times, I bet you. Yeah, he'd hang up on me, and I'd call him back. No, really, just come in here. Please come in here. Less than a minute later, my phone rings again, and she's a like, third time. A third time, and she's like, "Would you please come inside?" And I, I heard it in her voice. I heard, you know, the crackling. Her, it's, she sounded terrified. He finally did come in. He's like, oh, "Are you happy now? I'm in here." You know, and I'm like, "Yeah, I'm happy, but look what's coming." As soon as I heard the roar. That, ungod that ungodly sound, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it definitely sounds like a, uh, like a team of freight trains. They're not lying about that. That's exactly what they sound like. I turned and yelled, get on the floor, get down now. And my mom, you know, at the time, she thought I was joking with her. She's like, oh, ha, ha, I said, I'm not kidding. And I literally, I linebackered my own mother. I mean, <laughs> I flattened her to the floor and said, stay down. And that's when, that's when it hit us. For what probably seemed like an eternity, but in reality it was only a few seconds, the EF3 tornado began tearing apart everything around them. First thing to go, we heard, you know, the windows just start exploding. This wall, this wall here where this bathroom was, which is good that we weren't in the bathroom, um, because there was a two by four through it and a four by four coming the other direction. There was a four by four through that wall there in the bedroom. That, those doors, of course, were just blown to pieces. With so much damage around them, the hallway they went to take shelter was one of the only places that would have been safe in their home. Somebody was watching over. Somebody was watching. Whether my parents or, you know, stuff like that. Somebody was watching. But the realization of what just took place was about to settle in for Brandon. You know, I'm, I'm a grown man. I start bawling. I mean, I was like, oh my God, you know, my family's home, my neighbor's homes. What are we going to do? And that really, you know, it really kind of eats at you. 
From above, you can see the devastation this tornado left behind. And even still today, the painful memories are seen throughout Brandon's neighborhood. You know, the pile of rubble, people see a pile, you know, a pile of trash. They were like, that was people's lives. You know, that was Dave's lives. That was, you know, that was our lives. That was Steve's life, you know. Memory, finding people's pictures down the, down the alley and stuff like that, it was just gut-wrenching. But Brandon, along with so many of his friends and neighbors, won't let this tornado discourage them. Most of us that are here, we don't plan on going anywhere. This isn't going to scare us off. This is just another step in life. It was a terrible one, and one we don't ever want to go through again. But this is our home. This is our neighborhood. If there's one piece of advice that Brandon's mother would give to anyone... Oh, pay attention to the warnings on your phone instead of just putting your phone down or pay attention to the, si like you said, the sirens and watch the news and everything else because we don't, we didn't, we do now. And for Brandon... Yeah, from now on, if mom calls and says bad weather, okay, I'm coming. <laughs> There can often be a lot of confusion when it comes to tornado sirens. On one side of the road, you start to hear the sirens when you see the tornado. However, on the other side of the road, nothing at all. That would be because the tornado is moving away from a populated area. So when would the powers that be sound of the alarm? Well, if we're in a warning box uh, that is generated by the National Weather Service and the warning box hits or has any part of the municipal areas of Champaign, Urbana, Savoy, U of I, we would sound the sirens. Even if a tornado is not in a specified municipal warning area, sirens may still be sounded, especially if extreme damage has been reported in prior stages of the storm's life, which in some circumstances could prompt a more serious warning. Just here recently, Taylorville, for the first time, in 15 years, the Weather Service issued a tornado emergency, meaning, you know, death, destruction, take shelter now. So in those cases, we have definitely uh, sound the sirens. At times, though, it can be very difficult to determine if a tornado is on the ground or not, as was the case here in Champaign County on June 10, 2018. The issue was is they issued a warning from McLean County all the way down to Champaign, and the storm had no... Uh, had no history of damage. There was no tornado on the ground until it actually hit. And actually when it hit, we had storm spotters on the ground within blocks and they couldn't see it. So it was, it was a very unusual phenomenon. And as a matter of fact, right as the tornado hit, the tornado warning expired. And there was also confusion what was in the impact zone too as well. If you look at one box, it was within Champaign. You look at another, it wasn't. That's where we did modify the policy to say, hey, you know, if it is close or it's in the municipality, we'll assign the, we will uh, sound the sirens. Just remember, however, when the sirens sound more than once, it's not a declaration of safety. No, there is no all clear. So when the sirens sound, what that means is take shelter for 30 minutes. If they sound again, that means start the clock again and take shelter for 30 minutes. Sometimes you may not hear a siren when it comes to a tornado. In that case, you have us as meteorologists to have your back. We'll take a look at the radar and let you know where we are seeing those signatures of a rotation in the atmosphere. Jack has more on how radar works. Thanks, Adam. The Doppler radar is by far our most important tool when it comes to tracking severe weather. They're officially called the Weather Surveillance Radar, or WSR-88D. The National Weather Service offices all across the United States have these radars, and this radar coverage network blankets the United States with a lot of overlapping coverage, so that way we have a clear as well as concise picture of where the showers and potentially severe thunderstorms are. But in post-war America in the 1950s, radar sites were developed across the U.S. and as they were developed and deployed, we're able to use them more for meteorological purposes. Now as technology has gotten better, we've been able to pick up certain intricate signatures of a storm thanks to the radar. In fact, the hook echo, the shape on the radar we used to see where a tornado would be, was first observed at Willard Airport in Champaign on April 9th of 1953. Now with dual polarization technology, we can even see things lofted up into a storm like debris and other non-meteorological 
meteorological elements. You may have wondered why north of Decatur it always looks like there is a thunderstorm or a rain shower that's not moving. Well, in fact, that's actually the radar picking up on a wind farm. And I'm actually at that wind farm. It's Radford's Run Wind Farm, formerly known as Twin Forks Wind Farm. And it's over 24,000 square acres of northwestern Macon County. There are 139 wind turbines on this wind farm, providing electricity for up to 90,000 homes. Wind farms can show up on radar due to a combination of the fact that the blades may actually fall within the radar's line of sight, so the radar can actually see the blades moving in its scans, as well as the fact that the turbulence from these wind farms mixes up the air, and the radar can pick up on that as well. The wind farm in Macon County is a nice big square, and when the wind comes through there, the turbulence actually is compounding, compounded the further along that it's going, so we actually see quite a bit of uh, interference there. This interference can impact a variety of radar parameters that can make it difficult to forecast storms. The other thing it impacts is the velocity data that we see on the radar. Because it's moving, again, it thinks there's something there, then it says, okay, well then I have, I have wind flowing through here, which you do, and then it's like, well, when a storm moves through there, as in the case of December 1st of last year, then the radar's not sure what's going on, and then we have a hard time seeing the rotation that might be inside the storm. So, yeah, it really disrupts that, but we have to be aware of that. So we have a map that we overlay on the radar that says, hey, there's a wind farm in this area. You just need, we just know that. Weathering the storm will return right after the break.